Welcome back. Happy New Year. Get a grip on lighting listeners. To kick things off, we got the one, the only, Margaret Wong from Wick Wong International. Greg, woo, fun as heck, bud. Hey. Yeah, to tell you the truth, I didn't know a lot about Mick Wong until about six months ago. And after that visit, learned a lot more. And they are definitely a dominant player in this market. Oh, yeah. Um, I love the pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger with Margaret in China. That, that was tells the best. you something right there. Yeah, yeah multiple man. pictures. Of awesome. course, folks, this episode of the show is brought to you. Um, uh, not of course, but this episode of the show is brought to you by Energy Focus. Go to energyfocus.com. That's E N E R G Y F. O C U S dot com, Greg. That's right, energyfocus.com. dot com. And come on, man. Today we're going to talk about. They are the first company to come out with flicker free LED tubes. They've been riding that train for a long time, and rightfully so. It's something that we've talked to a lot of people on the negative effects of flicker free. And Energy Focus is really the first company that went into it and dove into it. You can see on their website they talk about. They actually have a white paper written on it, and they have tubes that are made specifically flicker free. I, I had a customer who was videotaping an LED tube from a, another manufacturer. And I said, I can't put these in my office. Look at how they're flickering. And I saw it and I'm like, I know what you mean. You want to try some flicker free. So I sent him these and he, I talked to him today and he called and he said, they're perfect. No flicker. I love it. So hopefully it turns into a sale. It hasn't yet, but it should go flicker free tubes. Go to the first people who did it, the people who put the most research into it, Energy Focus. Go to energyfocus.com. That's E N E R G Y F O C U S.com, baby. Energyfocus.com for your flicker free tubes. They got a bunch of other hot products up on that website as well, so check them out when you get a chance. And of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, our national event, April 19th to 22nd in Biloxi, Mississippi. Be there or be square. Come on now. But for right now, we're talking with Margaret Wong from Mick Wong International. The Get a Grip on Lighting Podcast. Welcome to the Get a Grip on Lighting Podcast, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Say hello to Greg Garrick, my co-host. Hello, Greg. Hello. Thanks for having us here at your office. And we're also with Blaine as well. Yeah, he's the bodyguard. The bodyguard. <laughs> yeah. At least that's what you told me before we started. I know. I know. I need a bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, uh, Margaret, how did you get started in this business? Well, I got started very early, properly before you were born, mm -hmm. and uh, almost 36 years ago, mm. when I first started a uh, transaction of uh, bringing in um, Chinese product into the United States, which is the Power Supply Court. Okay. And I was in Chicago at the time, and I had a client in Chicago and uh, wanted to buy uh, products uh, from China. And I was able to launch the deal and uh, and started with um, an electrical cord, which is electrical product. You're talking just a, a plug-in outlet? Yeah, outlet? what they call the orange cord, SPT2 and HHTW, all these uh, power supply cord, the extension cord. Okay. And uh, did you grow up in China? I uh, was born in Hong Kong. And okay. grew up in Hong Kong and educated in Hong Kong. The day that I graduated from University of Hong Kong, I came to the United States. So you're you do you speak uh, Cantonese and Mandarin? I speak Cantonese and Mandarin. Okay. Yes. So you didn't live through the Cultural Revolution or anything like that in China? No, I didn't. Thankfully, I, yes, I was actually living through the British colony. Yeah. Uh, education in Hong Kong. Can I ask you what you think of what's happening in Hong Kong now? is amazingly, surprisingly disturbing because okay. I always think that Hong Kong is the freest country um, in the world, but uh, what happened- Asia. Certainly in Asia, anyway. You know, certainly in Asia, but what happened today is really shockingly unbelievable what is happening. You're so. seeing a revolution, like a slow sort of change towards totalitarian state capitalism in in uh in hong, in hong kong right now and there's a resistance to it but some people are welcoming it there margaret right. and i mean we're off topic here but i'm, I'm fascinated by that topic well is uh is is you know knowing being you know born in hong kong and yeah. came from hong kong and we all have a, a you know different perspective sure and i think that uh, is a very complicated issue it sure is and so, um, but it's very sad. It's mm. very disturbing to see what's happening. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping this is going to be resolved soon because mm -hmm. Hong Kong is a very lovable city. Mm -hmm. It's a very um, free country, I mean city. Yeah. And uh, seeing what happened today is, is very sad mm -hmm. to the city. Um, so I guess so your power supply cord, going back to that, did you... Did you bring it over from Hong Kong or from mainland China? From mainland China. Mainland China. Okay. Um, it was manufactured in China, mm -hmm. and I was actually believed at that time I was one of the earliest, if not the earliest one, to get the UL listed product, electrical UL listed product uh, from UL. Um, at that time, it was okay. remember that was 36 years ago, made in China, and get it uh, UL approved. Well, it was just so that's 1983. Uh, 1984. 19, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean China. No, 19, 1980s. It is late 1980 because okay. um, I'm trying to remember. I came here to Sacramento in 1985, mm -hmm. so it was right around that time. Mm -hmm. China was just opening up. China was just opening up. It was very difficult. Very. It was. A, it was like. It always took a year to get a product approved. You're like a pioneer. Like a pioneer. Like a pioneer. You see, like a lot of people followed you then. Well, I would say that it was hard. And after that, believe it, it was a lot more people believed it can happen. Mm -hmm. It will happen. Manufacture in China, quality in China. Mm -hmm. You get a UL listed, get it safety proofed and coming over to the United States. And that's really is the beginning of getting product from China, electrical product. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you're making a chair or a table or buying a pants, you know. Yeah, you're you making something that could be a possible fire hazard. Exactly. Especially a power supply, right? Exactly. So very, very early start, you know, McWong has been with power supply. Okay. And electrical cord. And then later on, we were able to, um, we were the first one that bring in uh, fluorescent ballast. I still remember that uh, we, we were actually, I was actually carrying a, a prototype of the ballast into China and have China manufacture the, the ballast mm -hmm. and, uh, and then get it qualified and then, you know, and bring it over to the United States and sell it to the U.S. market. That was uh, also the late 1980s. What brand was that? Of the Was it a McWong branded ballast? It was, was our it? brand is Pacific Ballast. Pacific. Pacific Ballast brand. Okay. And we do a lot of OEM. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, private label, and our own brand is a Pacific Ballast brand. Were these magnetic magnetic ballasts or were There's they electronic? Ma magnetic. They're all <laughs> magnetic <laughs> fluorescent wow. ballasts. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's, that's a pioneer. Yeah, it's a pioneer. For and, sure. For sure. And it is... Um, is you know at one time that of course you know from 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 ballas into uh, including transformers mm -hmm. including HID you know ballas at one time we had over three hundred different SKUs of ballas mm. that coming from China. Where does the testing take place? Did it take place in America or in China or both? Both. Yeah. Uh, the testing took place in both in China and also and also we we do it in here both. What were some of the challenges in the early days? Like even now, um, you know, uh, you know, Chinese factories will contact lighting distributors like small. Like I'm a small lighting distributor mm -hmm. uh, in Toronto, Canada. I'll get contacted by um, you know factories in China asking about you know, if I want to buy lights direct from them or whatever. Mm. And and that's a possibility. People do it all the time. Mm. We, we've interviewed six distributors on this trip, two of which import lots of stuff directly from China. Mm -hmm. Not so, I did it, I did, I, you know, I did it a couple of times. I bought some stuff, uh, some tubes or whatever, but it's not really what I do best. Mm -hmm. But I found that there was huge communication barriers, things mm -hmm. that you expect to be understood by another person entering into a business transaction, not being understood, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, um, in 1986, 87, you're a woman of Asian descent speaking the language. What kind of challenges was there then, though, in terms of um, a nation, a communist nation? Uh, just open it. I mean, I'm assuming it was Shenzhen where, um, what's his name, Deng Xiaoping opened up the special economic zone or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing in that section of China. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the barriers in terms of cultural barriers that you were overcoming at the time? What was What was happening? Well, if you're talking about in the late 1980s, there's a tremendous amount of barriers. Mm. It's, not a it's not a matter of language barriers, mm. a barrier of understanding of the level of the qualities, okay. the level of commitment, 
expected. When they said they can deliver, they have to deliver on time. When they said they're going to be able to stand behind a product, you know, all this interpretation of what we can accept in the United States, not necessarily that's what they interpret. Mm. So you almost have to, you know, express yourself in very, very detail, making sure they understand. It's kind of like a missionary work. Sure. You know, you got to be able to tell them like a Bible, you know, you need sure. to do the, all these line by line and so that they will sign their You're commit. like a missionary of capitalism. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, that's so, a, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, and I, 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 a lot of time, you know, people think that it's, it's just a language. You know, language is easy. You know, sure. you can always have translation. Sure. But is the is the is the understanding and the acceptance of what we do in the United States and the infrastructure of what we do, you know, in other words that, you know, if you're gonna be sell it to me, you can't sell it to my clients sure. or if you said that you're gonna stand behind it and give me a warranty of twelve months, that's the warranty, what the warranty means yeah. and you know, it it, it very well, difficult. What what is a warranty? Right. What is a warranty? Like Warranties. conceptually, what is a warranty? It means that you are going to pay, if I buy this from you, you're going to pay for the mistakes. What does that mean to them? Oh, that will be, it itself will be, you can write a book about it. Sure. So, um, but, but that was at that time. But over time, over the 30 somewhat years, China has learned a lot improve a lot so much competition going on so the only way for them to sell the product is to provide the services as we need sure so if you're talking about today is night and day yeah. And today, the improvement uh, is tremendous, okay, in terms of understanding what we need, understanding what what we want. And I, I think that, uh, but still, you know, for, a, for anybody who, who distributor or OEM to go over there, they still need some help locally because it, at today is not that much of understanding of the culture or the needs is to be able to command um, the, uh, the the delivery and also the uh, the the R and D the quality and a little bit different aspect mm -hmm. of sure. it. Um, and China still is very very good in in discipline in doing mass production. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very successful in that. But when you get into more customization. You know, more smaller uh, uh, lot or doing some R and D. This you just need a lot more help in in making sure they understand. I but think it's a big improvement. I think that you know um, what I think that Americans understood China when Mao was alive. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. they understood that that's a really bad country. Um, there's a tyranny there. Um, it's communist. It's too big for us to do anything about. Mm -hmm. It's too powerful for us to do anything about. But we need them to stay there and, and not spread their ide ideology into Hong Kong, Taiwan, these other areas. That was kind of the position of the United States. Most Americans haven't left that position, actually. Mm -hmm. And they a lot of things they don't understand. Like China is the oldest country in the world. China had the largest economy f over the last for. Over the last 4,000 years, they've had the largest economy for 3,700 years of that mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It was the most innovative country in the world for 3,700 years mm -hmm. until, you know, European, the rise of, of European capitalism and, and discovery of the world. And it, in a sense, it, it's not unnatural for China to return to that position. Mm -hmm. Like historically, it wouldn't be unnatural for China to be the most powerful country in the world. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be unnatural for China to have the most dynamic economy in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what we're seeing emerging now. China's gone from being a copycat to needing missionary work from, you know, uh, from people like uh, like you, Margaret Wong, to now maybe the table's turning a little bit and them becoming a consumerist culture. Do you see that them being able to now manufacture? I mean, you see companies over there very, very powerful. Um, you know, you hear about Huawei, but Xiaomi is another very powerful Chinese company. Mm -hmm. uh, are they turning inward and now are they, is their economy going to teach us what we uh, and now innovate and we're going to learn from them? Is that switching now? Is that is that process become to ha starting to happen, Margaret, where China may lead the world in that sense? Well, I yeah, you have you, you're absolutely right. I think that there are some fundamental elements of what 
uh, Chinese uh, is is uh, good at is number one. They're very hardworking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're very hardworking, meaning that if you pay them well, if you if you pay them extra, they 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 work beyond what we American can imagine. Sure. Okay. So um, hard work is culturally honored. Culturally China. honored. Yeah. It, it, it's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example that you know, say our factory open at seven thirty. And but we pay the workers by basic salary plus by pieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they want to make more money, they will line up at seven o'clock. They want to come in to mm -hmm. the factory and be able to generate more pieces so that they get paid more. So you know that ethics is is, is good, and it's just a very enthused and working hard to make more money. Okay, mm -hmm. number two, they're very obedient. You know, this is what we call the Confucianism. It just taught you to, you know, obey to your superiors, your parents, your boss, your, 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 your government officials. The culture of honoring your people. Honoring. Yeah, honor So culture, if yeah. you set good guidelines, a good roadmap, they're very, they, they, they're obedient. They're very, mm -hmm. they listen to it. They follow the rules. Sure. Okay. They are not very good in trying to be creative or to be democracy or trying to fight you no. because they believe what you give it to them is something they want sure. to follow. So this is something very, very, I think is, is, is a lot of strings in that. And thirdly, they, they, they really want, they're very proud of coming up with some new innovative um, technologically, especially in technologically new ideas, you know. So they spend a lot of time, a lot of thinking in coming up with new design, new engineering. And this is exactly why in the last decade or last 20 years is once if you open up that opportunity with the platform, with the incentive, it's amazing. After all, you know, we have $1.3 billion Chinese, you know, it's a lot sure. of people. A lot yeah, of people sure. with government incentives, with the company incentives, you know, it, it just tremendous amount of opportunities for them to to dig into the R&D. And it's just starting. It's just starting. It is just the it, beginning of it. So, and fourthly, a China market itself, you know, the demand as a nation, you is mean. the nation, the China itself. Yeah. The demand for that kind of product is is huge. Also, mm. you're looking at Huawei or Xiaomi. You know they all because the domestic market is very strong. It's not just going outside for export. One of the things they talk about the the whole Huawei issue with the U.S. government is not has you know spying and all that aside. Possibly that's it. Maybe it's because the phones are better than Apple's. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Like that might be the actual issue. Uh, you know, it's like they, Xiaomi is is a, is a is a monster force, and a lot of these companies, these Chinese companies, they the integration of the hardware and the device that Apple does so well that other American firms always seem to separate. Like Google, there's Android, and then there's a device maker, and then there's a software maker. Xiaomi is a powerhouse when it comes to keeping uh, the device and like like Apple does that, and that's not unnatural for Chinese companies. And they have the power, the labor, the intelligence, the schools. It's going to change a lot of things. I think there's going to be a, 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 a turn. I'm a Canadian, so I can look at it from the. I'm not in the fight. Well, maybe I'm on the. I'm on America's team. I don't know. But it's an interesting time to look at the changing nature of these these relationships. Um, you know, and you said that the, the Chinese people are very obedient. It's interesting. I I'm not so sure that's true. I mean, if you look at Chinese history for the last hundred years or so, it was a very crazy place to be i mean china's paid a huge price in terms of their stability their current stability and when you hear um president g speak he always speaks in terms of harmony you know harmonious rise a peaceful rise and sometimes you look at it you think is this is this actually um you know nation state marketing or is he serious if you look at what happened with the cultural revolution in china and all that sort of stuff and the great leap forward and how many people died and, and that they've paid a big price for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you a question. You might want to take it out. Is it, is, it, is it dangerous for the United States not to be the most powerful economic force in the world? Well, it depends on how you define powerful, you know, and I, I think that um, I, I, 
I think harmony is is important for for the for the global welfare, and mm -hmm. I think that I don't want to see that everybody want to be powerful. Is it military powerful? Is that going to be economically powerful? And after all, China is is emerging from a communist country into a capitalist country, mm -hmm. but because of so many people, you just cannot turn around and become a capitalist country mm -hmm. over time. Sure. This is, I think, that China had done a great job. It kind of evolves into what we so call a capitalist country sure. because you know, so four thousand years of history is not like two or three hundred years of history in in. United States. So there's a lot of deep rooted problem. There's a lot of deep rooted, you know, history that they need to be able to transfer to. So I think that um, is that dangerous? I I think that there are um, China needs America and America needs China. Yeah, I think it's true. So huh? I, 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 I think they both need each other. And I think that if you're talking about I want to be more powerful than you, I, I don't want it you know, measure that way. I want to measure is it just that how you could be able to help each other to grow in a way that benefit both parties. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and China has been the market itself for 1.3 billion people in China is a huge potential for American to go out there and reach that market. Yeah, Americans don't think that way, though. They don't think that way because they're still very protective of having Chinese product to come in. Mm. You know, but they, they have to think about it. if you eat my lunch, I can eat your dinner because sure. <laughs> there's so much that you can go out there and reach the market and be able to 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 feed the dinner. Like, well, right now it's all that what you're talking about is the sale of luxury goods in China. Right. You know, so right now you have like uh, the main export from the West to China is Louis Vuitton. Um, you know, expensive scotches, um, you know, this kind of stuff. Really fine made. Well, Chinese are very hungry for American lifestyle. Yeah, for sure. Let's put it that can way. you blame them? Yeah, no, because they want to increase their status, you know, and mm -hmm. then they are hungry for American lifestyle because they want to be different. They mm -hmm. want to be live like us. They want to be able to be as, you know, comfortable as us. So that hungry for lifestyles, including LV back, including Starbucks coffee, including sure. Madonna. I mean, when Starbucks went to China, I would never think that it could be this successful. Unbelievable! Every other block, you have a Starbucks. You know, it really even is though, unbelievable. Actually. Even though they're they're more expensive than some of the local <laughs> coffee shop, but they go do very well. There's also the emergence of a Chinese coffee culture right now too. I I, I, I read an article about these Chinese coffee shops uh -huh. that they have in Shanghai that are uh, that are really good. But let's get back. So you started with the. Let's get back to Lightning, yeah. Greg. We're gonna, yeah, we kind of want to break down I, I, the timeline. I'm, I'm a fascinated bit. by China as a as a, <laughs> as a cultural force in the world. Margaret, yes, so. I can see that. <laughs> so go, going into the timeline a little bit. So you graduated from Hong Kong and you moved immediately to Sacramento. No, okay. I graduated from the University of Hong Kong, major in finance and economics, mm -hmm. and then I went over to Chicago. I okay. worked and lived in Chicago for 10 years before I moved over here. What did you do in Chicago? I worked for a uh, management, one of the largest management consulting firm in uh, Chicago downtown, and they manage over 100 different nonprofit organizations. And um, so I started as an accountant. Okay. And uh, when I entered a company and uh, bookkeeper accountant, and then um, and when I left, I was the controller and VP and and uh, of the company. So what made you leave? I get the corners of Chicago. Is too much wind. I was uh, I, <laughs> too much wind. <laughs> too much wind. Too too cold. Windy city. Good. I, I was born yeah. uh, from a tropical. Hong you know, Kong is city. warm like Florida. Yeah. 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 So I I just I have enough of of the corners. You know, like almost four or five months of the year is mm -hmm. is is too cold for me. Okay. So I was looking for the sun. I was <laughs> looking for opportunity to move to a warmer place. Okay. So. And you moved to Sacramento. I moved to Sacramento. Okay. It it um it was uh, it was chosen by a very um uh, 
you know, it, it, it's planned by God that I come to Sacramento. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a job lined up when you moved here or you just came here? Then you were going to figure out what you were doing. Well, one of my colleagues, um, when I worked together with him for 10 years in Chicago, and uh, he's an electrical engineer, mm -hmm. and he married, he had a girl, his girlfriend lived in Sacramento, so he, he, he got married in Sacramento. And he knew that I wanted to come to California, so he helped me to find a job, and I, I came here, and um, I worked for a bank and for about a year, and then after that, I get bored with corporate system, so I started my own company, and together with him. And, um, and that was Mick Wong. That was Mick Wong. And um, his last name is McFarland, mm. and I'm Wong, and I told him I want to start a company called Wong Mick. He said, there's no <laughs> such thing as Wong Mick. <laughs> so this is why our name is called Mick Wong. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, and then this is why from day one we've been involved with electrical because he is an electrical engineer. So okay. that's why we work with electrical view. I'm not an electrical engineer, but mm -hmm. I'm a business person. Sure. And um, we start with the power supply cord, and we get into the ballast business, and then getting in a lot of lighting components, and this is how we evolve. So you guys are a lighting components firm, and so you started with ballast. Did you, did you guys use sockets and switches and stuff like that, or all those sorts of little bits? Now we're into the Internet of Things. Right, right. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. And uh, McLuhan started from day one is focusing most of the uh, the light source and the power supply. Mm -hmm. And that, to, you know, day one, that's what we are very How to get electricity at. to the lamp. Exactly. So we, the balance is uh, no better than understanding the power supply side, the electrical side, you know, you know how you can get lamps to, you know, lit up and all that. So... This is what we focus in, and then we evolve from you know the fluorescent magnetic ballast, you know, into the the uh, transformers, into the HID ballast, and then get into the um, the uh, LED drivers, sure. and then from the semiconducting platform, we're getting into the, uh, the the sensors and the controls, and also get now what we call the IoT, the Bluetooth mesh. Mm. So, you know, we still do our legacy product, but we really truly believe the lighting view is going to get into this IoT big time. Mm -hmm. So in the last five years, you know, our team has been focusing a lot of this wireless lighting, wireless lighting, IoT lighting, controls, sensors, and we focus mainly on Bluetooth mesh. Mm. So to, to clarify, then you, your customer is a lighting manufacturer? Our customer is mainly is OEM. Oh, yeah. Yep. OEM. Uh, traditionally, from day one, is, is OEM. And we do sell to some distributors. Okay. But we're all lighting components and uh, to OEM and from our own label to private label, uh, customized products. And, um, and then, you know, we sell occasionally to a distributor, too. What, what brand is your – you guys have LED drivers, I assume, then? Yes, we have LED drivers. And what is that called? Pacific is it, Lighting? Is it Pacific again? Uh, Pacific. Pacific. Pacific, okay. Pacific is our brand name. Mm -hmm. And we have the Pack Wave. Pacific Wave, Pack Wave is also our trademark name, too. Okay. So depending on what products that we have. Do you, do you guys – so we interview a lot of people on the internet. I always – one of my uh, guests, the uh, president of Naumco. I don't know if you're familiar with Naumco. Mm -hmm. is the is the, is the, is the um, I was going to say manufacturers. No, is the, uh, the contractors, right? So we were interviewing the president of Namco, and he said, the IoT of things. And I thought that was hilarious, you know, because there's so much talk about, you know, Internet of Things, and you know, it's going all around in this. But and we interviewed uh, also Simon Slupek. What was the name of that company? Uh, Silver. Silver. Silver, Silver. yes. Know, so yeah. we had a great talk with him, and he also insists that Bluetooth mesh is, like, is emerging as the default technology for the internet of things it's not going to be wi-fi there's not going to it's going to be bluetooth mesh and um and then there's also this idea from simon um and then from yourself and then also within the lighting community that lighting is going to be the basis of the internet of things 
simply because of its pervasiveness in all indoor environments and the outdoor environment actually as well. So artif artificial or electric lighting being the sort of platform to which the Internet of Things is connected. So we, Absolutely. So lighting has to get it right. And once lighting gets it right, then everybody's car can connect to it. Everybody's refrigerator can connect to it. But what we have to do is it's going to be a lighting play. I'm not so sure about that. You know, and but lighting people are convinced, convinced, Margaret. I'm absolutely uh, agree with, with, oh, not just believe. I think that I very much advocating for that because that's an interesting word, advocating. That's advocating for yeah. that because uh, Bluetooth itself is a proven protocol. I mean, you look at the phone. Everybody now have a phone. Yeah, Bluetooth is very reliable. You know, it's, it's proven in a way. So how are you going to get a Bluetooth into a Bluetooth mesh and how you networking and, you know, how you going to, the app is already there for you to do the control and, you know, and, and lighting, keep in mind that when we first started, it's all mechanical lighting, but, you know, like a decade ago, LED is a semiconducting platform. Hmm. All of the lighting has become a semiconducting platform. When you call them a semiconducting, you have a chip. The chip, it can do multiple things. Sure. It can do many things with the chip. So once you get the chip, not only because of the protocol, but also that they can do wireless, they can talk to many different, you know, uh, points in, mm. in that semiconducting. Because of that, you know, and using the protocol of Bluetooth, which is proven, is the way to go. And, you know, human being is human being. You got to have lights. Okay. Lights is always tied in with a human. Mm -hmm. Lights is always tied in with the power. Everywhere you go, you got to have lights. So I see the lights going to be the future hub. Future hub not only does discharge light, but it's going to talk to many of the electrical devices in the building, outside the building, indoor, outdoor. And that can be not only power, you know, for the light, but also power the other gadgets and also be able to be the GPS of the building. Okay. So let me ask you the question then. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you you believe that the it's insistence that lighting be the base the base platform of the uh, Internet of Things. Okay. Where are we going to get the money to pay for all these Internet of Fixtures things? Because we, we, I've put in a lot of LED light fixtures that should last a long time. And I need to go back to these peeps now and say, you know, Mr. Customer, you remember those LED lights we put in two or three years ago? Mm -hmm. They're coming out now, son. And why is that? Because we got to do this Bluetooth mesh thing. What's the, what's the, what's the, the business case for it? Well, you you said it very very clearly that in the past everybody were talking about IoT lighting. You're talking about you know all of these devices and and all that, but it's not really commonly used. It's not that that you know a lot of people worry about the payback, or worry about the installation, worry about hmm. the you know the warranty behind all that. This is going to come. If you see in the last few years, you know this is becoming so robust. It's because you know, um, you you people are starting to think about wireless save a lot of costs of labor, mm -hmm. and installation is going to be much easier than you think it is because the Bluetooth protocol is going to be able to make it so much easier. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's proven, and everybody going to have a phone on your hand that mm -hmm. is already have a command. I mean, it's not like I'm asking, begging you, please have a phone so that you have an app. Sure. You already have it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So I think that the, the LED, you know, think is already cost is already coming down. What it really takes right now is I always say you have a lot of software people. The software people are the language, you know, you have the French, you have the German, you have sure. all these different language. Everybody wants to have own their own speak their own language. But you got to have somebody who would generate these components, these kind of hardware mm -hmm. to be able to firmware these languages and be able to make it very easy for the consumer of, uh, to buy. Okay. The consumer doesn't know just software, doesn't, cannot work with hardware. Mm -hmm. That's why we make one position ourselves. Our business plan is to be able to provide these hardware, these components that can accommodate all these languages and sell to the consumer in a much available way. 
in in interoperability, yes, ease that's, of that's insulation. Yes. I am very versatile. If you want to speak Chinese, I give you Chinese. If you speak German, I get German. And I have the parts and product to sell it to the consumer. The consumer is wanted to be able to be easy, workable. You you stand behind that. And well, the consumer won't do anything with it if it's not easy. Exactly. It's not even about like want it to be. It's like exactly. it's useless to them if it's not easy. And this is it's why useless. Like, it won't be used. Exactly. By definition, it will be useless if it's not easy. This is exactly what we think. Yeah, you know, traditionally we're very good at getting components. I mean, that's what okay. we're good at. Not necessarily we're the best in the software side, but we definitely are the components people. So we are right now working with multiple multiple software people, including Sever, and I think that uh, it works out perfect because you have more, 10 to 1, you have more software people wanted to talk about how to manage, you know, the, 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 the IoT than you're actually going to have a hardware. They think hardware is a low end, you know, lower end, you know, uh, uh, task, but IT is going to be the very important end to The software people would say that. Right. So right now, McWong our offering is the is the most number of components that we off, our offering is tremendous to accommodate the IoT Bluetooth. Yeah. We in you know we we're, we're the one of the best is offering all kinds of uh, of uh, components. Now it's up to the manufacturers, right. the OEMs, to integrate this into their fixtures. Absolutely. And then, and then it's up to companies like Silver to build applications and software that make it easy for the consumer to. Because, right. you know, for me, as someone who's in, uh, on the end of the business, we're opposite ends. You're on compu components, and I'm in the trenches putting light fixtures into people's buildings. Right. And I know that if it's going to be complicated, none of my customers are going to use it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But if they can just open up their phone and now they're pro, oh, that light automatically tells them that I'm number 26112525561. What do you want to do with me? I want to group you into this group. Tick, tick, tick. You're in that group. Right. right? You understand what I mean? And now I want you to turn off at this time. Like if it's super easy to use and commission and work with and you don't have to be an expert and you don't have to take six months of courses or be a, be a program. Like no one would use a phone if they had to program an app. Mm -hmm. right. They just want to use the apps. Right. Right. They want to call the Uber. Right. You know, it's like put, click it. Okay, there it is. And we were talking about Uber the other day about how, you know, you should just be able to take a picture of your credit card and know that it's your credit card. Yeah. It should just automatically, like it shouldn't, like, it should be super easy to use. It will come. You know, today, you know, you're trying to do, you know, the, the retrofit or do the, you know, after fixtures, installation, you do the, the installation and commissioning mm -hmm. after. But eventually, these components or these IoT stuff is going to be embedded in the fixtures. So you almost are not cannot afford not to offer that mm -hmm. once people are hooked with these IoT. So eventually it will come, you know, and I think if you make it easy to install, cost effective, good payback, and and be able to be available, mm -hmm. you know, availability, ease for people to buy, to procure, it will happen. It, do you guys feel that whatever you're coming up with will be able to go into existing fixtures? Right. You're going to be able to go into something that Michael put in two years ago and now make it IoT capable or whatever we want to call it. Right. Compatible. Compatible, right. yeah. So this is exactly what we're doing. You know, we're putting our, all these uh, control wireless already into our ballast, into our drivers. So automatically, if you put in a driver, you don't have to put a sensor. You don't have to put a, you know, you, you just kind of try to make it a one-stop job. So that it's easy for OEM, easy for retrofit. So it's going to come. Because when you get in a semiconducting business, that chip or whatever control system is there is going to be, is totally feasible. Hmm. And, you know, imagine that when I keep saying that the lighting hub, that hub is not just to give you lights, but, you know, you have all kinds of, um, uh, uh, including the the data collection including the accessibility was, yeah, including the the securities you know counting people how many people go to where where you're going what you turn on what kind of data not to talk about something like harvesting dimming you know that's standard those are standard behavior Circadian, lighting yeah Standard behavior lighting and also work interact beacon with other, you know, gadgets so that they give you tremendous amount of intelligence mm. in the building. 
that you wouldn't, you can't imagine because right now you have a GPS outside, but you don't have a GPS inside. Mm -hmm. Who go to what room? How many times you turn on that coffee machine? Who's coming in? Who's co leaving? You don't have to have a batch. So here's a here's you a just the light will tell you you coming in, you going out. You, how many times you go to that room? All gonna be monitored. Have you ever heard of this guy Peter Drucker? He's dead now. <laughs> okay, so he has his famous three questions, right? Who is the customer? Right? What does the customer want to buy? Who is the non-customer? Right? So if we ask ourselves the question with I IoT and Bluetooth mesh, right? The Peter Drucker's famous questions asking GM in the 1950s, who is your customer? Right? What do you mean who is my customer? No one will ask. Like, if you don't know the answer to that question, you're probably going to make mistakes, right? So if you, if you say that, that those are the fundamental questions of any business. Who is your customer? What do they want to buy? Right? Is it, is the customer the person under the light or the person that's the owner of the building or is the customer the person that wants the data, right? So for me, it's almost like I think the IoT will be a cascading uh, um, tidal wave of change when, the, when or if the data becomes worthwhile to somebody to have. You see the data wars that happened five or six years ago between uh, their first was the patent wars, then it was the data wars between these the companies that love Silicon Valley. They're all out here anyway, right? And then in China too. Um, but when that data becomes valuable or because there's a currency to it, who cares how much the light fixture costs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because what I want is the data. As soon as the customer becomes the person that can do something with the data, then you will see a complete tidal wave of IoT. I agree. Absolutely. We always want to talk about energy efficiency. You know, all these LED, mm -hmm. everything. Energy efficiency is a slam dunk. I mean, you, you want to sure. use wireless LED to be energy efficiency. You always want to save labor costs, sure. you know, because, uh, you know, the wireless is, you know, is no wire, okay? So, you know, the labor cost of maintenance and also and also the labor cost of recording information, mm -hmm. the labor cost of, of trying to be able to find out what's happening, you sure. know, that kind of thing. That's also so is the benefit of this IoT lighting. Mm -hmm. And then later on, when you call about the data, the data is collection is so important to determine so many things mm -hmm. that this hub is going to also do that thing. And then we talk about security. We talk about safety. You know, you can go on and on mm -hmm. with a lot of features that you can kind of put in a different bucket. Of course. One is if you put all these buckets in, you look at it, who can command all of this? Is wherever you have people, you have lights. Mm -hmm. And the lights is going to be able to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. And that's a very basic form factor, I call it. You know, it's going to be, you, it's, 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 it's going to get there. Now, getting there, you got to be able to have the, uh, you know, the right language or the hardware, software available and reliable, people who stand behind the warrant that and easy to install and into self commissioning. Self commissioning. Yeah. And I was saying that if it's talking about five years ago, you're not going to happen. But now it's coming in very, very fast. Well, you said get there. You know what there is called? It's called the matrix. Yes. No, seriously. Yes. Like that's what it is. Yes. It's going to be like a matrix-like environment. So you're going to be in the internet, right? With Li-Fi and with um, with the, all these fixtures connected. So the idea of the think about the idea of getting a ride from somebody else and not having to have any physical transaction with them. So first of all, the, the magical GPS of the satellites tells this guy over on the other side of Sacramento to come to McWong and pick up this guy, and there's a picture of him there, and take him somewhere else, and the two of them could never even look at each other or speak, and one guy will get the money from the other guy's bank account <laughs> into his bank account yes. without ever showing a card. Like if you think like never mind cash, never mind bartering, never mind showing a credit card. Like you don't have to do anything like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you think about if you told someone that in the 1950s, what they would say to you? You said that's never going to happen, right. 
right? You think about where we're going, the technology of facial recognition software. You think of the tech, like, you know, I, um, I'm a person of interest to the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol Agency because of all this gear I have to bring into the United States, right? So they're like, who the hell are you? I'm like, I'm a subject matter expert in the field of lighting. Nobody else can do what I do. What are you talking about, son? You know, I'm a, I'm a nobody. So anyway, it's difficult for me to get him. So, but they scan my irises. Okay. So they they scan my irises, they take my fingerprints, right? So it's interesting that why couldn't everybody be continuously scanned all the time? All right. All right. Right? right. Like you think about this, this is where it's going. All right. You know, that's the matrix. Yeah. Take a blue pill or red pill, you want to know about it or not, because right. that's where we're going. Is that a fundamentally good thing to you, Margaret? Absolutely. I, I, I think it can be controlled, it can be monitored, but I think that um, that matrix is what we wanted to to go through a hub. I always use that word hub. What's the easiest, most convenient hub to be able to command these matrix? It's going to be the light. Well, the, the matrix of the universe is commanded with light. Right. The sun. The, yeah. The sun is the one who controls our life. Sure. So imagine the outside is the sun, but your light is going to be your sun. Your sun is the power. The power is going to drive what we want to go for. So that's why our team believe in the Bluetooth mesh, the Internet of Things, of the wireless mm -hmm. aspect, and our company are very focused on trying to get the hardware so that it become a deliverable to the end users. It will be something that I can combine firmware, the software, into our product so that it become a deliverable product. This goes back to what you said initially when you wanted to move to Sacramento is you're looking for the sun. Yeah, <laughs> continue to look at the sun. <laughs> I have it written right here. I'm like <laughs> yes, go for the sun. You know, right now we are also going for the sun. The so sun we, tells us what to do. We didn't say the, the word artificial intelligence yet, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask you for your permission on something. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was talking to, was it Dr. Veach? Yes, it was. So Dr. Jennifer Veach is a, a studies light. And she's, uh, uh, you know, in that field of people that are discovering what light is. Because we actually don't even really know what light is. Mm -hmm. They don't really know. It's a, from, the, from the physics of it to the spiritual. We're creatures of the light. We don't even really know what light is yet. And when we really figure out what it is, like how photosynthesis works, right? Like we need to figure that out big time. And we need to, we, and this idea of energy efficiency, I resent energy efficiency a little bit too. Like you, I saw that little bit of resentment there. I want clean energy so I can use as much of it as I want. Thank you very much. Okay. I want, I want as much to use as much energy as I want, but you have this term artificial intelligence. But Jennifer Veach, I said, there's artificial light. She said, there's no artificial light. There's only electric light and natural light. Can we change it to electric intelligence right here on the Get a Grip on Lightning podcast, Margaret, me and you? Tell all these Silicon Valley guys that they ain't making artificial intelligence. <laughs> intelligence is either intelligent or it's not. It's not artificial. Just like Jennifer A. Veach said, there's no artificial light. You either have electric light or natural light. Is it electric intelligence and is it going to be led by the lighting business? Those are my two questions. For well, you. you know, that's why I'm still going back to the solar. You know, the solar <laughs> is, is you know, natural. Sure. It's not artificial. Sure. You all, that's why you have the panel. You know, when you have the DC lighting, you can collect those light and also drive our light. So mm. it, it cannot, you know, it can be natural. It depends on how you're going to be able to collect that. You know, mm. and be able to store in the light and using all of IoT, you know, manipulating, you could be able to pull natural light and general light. You know, it is AI is not AI, but it's just that you can be very natural, as natural as you can be. There's only intelligence. We, had, we, interested, we interviewed another doctor who said that by 2030, we'll have a computer as powerful as the human brain. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think so, because I don't even think they know how powerful the human brain is, actually. I don't even think what we're, we're, as a species, we're conscious enough to understand what we're capable of, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And then he said by 2060, we're going to have computers that are more powerful than all the human brains in the world put together that ever lived before us and will live after us. And I'm not sure about all that, but what I am sure is that along the way, there needs to be someone who's making the components to this whole thing to put it all together. And I think McWong is doing that. And I thank you for doing that, Margaret. And Absolutely. You know, even though the computer can be very smart, but if you don't have the hardware to put all these computers together, you still, 
not something. You know, I we believe in the basic frame and basic. You know, is the food is the food is the hardware to make it happen. It's artificial so, without the hardware. Right, there it's you are. artificial without the hardware. There you are. Now then, it is artificial. There you go. And it's a concept. Right. Yeah, we need the hardware. So right. I thank you for making it and being passionate about it and being a leader and also for being a guest on our show, Margaret. Well, thank you very much. It has been very interesting talk. Thank, thank you. you. It's great. Energyfocus.com. That's E N E R G Y F O C U S.com, baby. Flicker free original. Flicker free that's right. original. Yes. They are the flicker free original. And that's important. It's something that a, a lot of other LED tubes in the marketplace have major flickering issues. And you don't want that if you're going to put this in your office. You don't no, want flickering. Son. It's bad. We know that. That's one thing we can prove on this show from all of our discussions. And these guys are the kings of that. Flicker-free technology, flicker-free tubes, and I think it ties in nicely with our discussion on uh, Margaret Wong because they're they're really on a mission. It's more it's not, more than just trying to sell a product. They're saying no more flicker. It's like Margaret's talking about the Bluetooth mesh. Yeah, I mean flicker is a choice, right? So um, and Energy Focus has chosen not to. And so they're the Flicker Free Original. Go to E-N-E-R-G-Y-F-O-C-U-S dot com. Maybe that's energyfocus dot com. And of course, Greg, where it all started, the original National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Go to NAILD.org. Our event coming in hot April 19th to 22nd, Biloxi, Mississippi, son. Be there or be square, boy. And of course... Margaret, how much fun did we have hanging out there? Oh, that was great. Impressive facility, the company. They've been around a long time. <sighs> Holy mackerel. Great person. All four of the people in the meeting um, could have been on. Could have been a guest on the show. And they might have to be. They might have be to be. Ready. Yeah, I just, okay, yeah, we just <laughs> had to bring them all in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're not going to say who they are yet because we want them to come on the show first. <laughs> and, of course, you, the listener, thank you the most. You guys have made all this happen. Thank you for downloading, listening, watching on YouTube. It's funny. We, you know, a lot of people like to watch it. So, hey, watch it, man. But, of course, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Really appreciate it. So does Greg. Bye for now. Written on the rectory wall, there's a sign there for all. You are lost. Lord is there to find you.